a fabulous Friday morning here on Whispering Hall. It's also the festive season, you know, we're all getting ready to celebrate Christmas. And so right here on Whispering Hope, we just want to extend season greetings to everyone who view us daily. We want to thank you for studying with us, you know, because together we learn and together we grow. And in the house this morning, this Friday morning on Whispering Hope, we have our Friday pastor, Pastor Orville wow. Joseph with us. And so today we just want to invite him to greet the people. And then we're going to ask him some questions. There's a special prayer request. Coming from the Rochelle Kiels, requesting prayer for her son, Antoine. He's struggling emotionally and so, and for other young men. So, Pastor Joe, just greet us here on Whispering Hope. And then additionally, we're going to ask you to pray and in your prayer to remember Antoine. Hey, good morning to everyone. Um, it is a joy again to join you on Whispering Hope, our Sabbath School channel. We are delighted that you have joined us this morning. I want to greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is the season. Over this weekend, we are going to be celebrating Christmas. Uh, for those of you who, uh, as it were, excited about this time, I pray that you'll have fun, you'll have enjoyment. Uh, we know it's a season when folks are, are, are jolly, as they would say. But we also know it's a season that reminds us that... You know, Jesus Christ came, gave his life for us so that we can have life and have it more abundantly. So whether you believe in the 25th of December or not, I encourage you to celebrate the fact that we have a savior who is now pleading in glory. I'm going to invite you now to just kindly bow your heads as we pray. Loving God and our Heavenly Father, we come this morning giving you praise, exalting your most holy name because you're worthy. Father, we come also in confession, recognizing that we are frail, we are sinful, and that we have transgressed your laws and, and even blasphemed against you. And we ask, kind Father, that you will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. Clothe us with your righteousness, kind Father. And so today, we can stand in your presence acceptable. We ask for your Holy Spirit's presence with us as we study your word. In a very special way, we want to remember Antoine. This morning, we ask that you will be with him in a very special way. We want to ask that you will just surround him with your divine presence, uh, that you will allow him to have the, the emotional vigilance and, and awareness and maturity that reflects your presence with him, that he, his ability to cope with the challenges and difficulties of life, its failures and, and its roller coaster nature, that you allow him to be able to navigate all those and hold on to you, no matter how dark or how difficult it might get. Pray that you'll be with his mother as well. Um, uh, as she expresses her concern, also, I pray that you'll be with those who have similar challenges in life, that you will reach out to them and, and make sure, kind Father, that they are secured and protected. We pray for those who have joined us every week for study. We pray for their families. We pray, kind Father, that you'll continue to strengthen and protect them, shield them, and uphold them with your right hand. Most of all, we pray that you will keep them in good health and that you will prosper them. May they continue to sing your praises, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We want to thank you, Pastor Joseph, for your prayer as usual. And so it's time. It's question time. And so question number one. First question for you. We have Barbara Buckley. She wants to know, Pastor Joseph, what is the difference between judgment and justice? Are they one and the same? Talk to us this morning. Okay, so in terms of judgment, and I, I want to speak a little in terms of the context of this week's lesson. And so we use judgment as part of the process that one is engaged in. So we talk about the pre-advent judgment, the whole process of Christ doing judgment, judging his people to determine whether they are condemned or they are not condemned. 
the, the final process is the judgment that is pronounced whether in, in terms of he that is just let him be un, let him just still and he that is unjust let him be unjust still but sometimes we use judgment to refer to the judging process but judgment essentially is the, the final determination of the judging process uh, justice um, has more to do with whether or not the process and the execution has been fear. Uh, and so is justice done? It, meaning, has people been given their full rights and has the judgment been performed with equity, etc.? Uh, that's justice. And so as humans, we cry out for justice. As uh, Even the devil cries out for justice before him. Justice is that you sin, therefore you should die. For God, justice is that you sin, you offer um, the, the sacrifice for forgiveness, and you accept that sacrifice, then you live. And so what we need to be able to appreciate is that at the end, when judgment is pronounced, that the process of justice would have taken place, that we can declare fully and clearly that God is just. Amen. So our second question for you, you know, this is coming from Trudy here. She wants to know, what about the people who have blasphemed against the Holy Spirit? Wouldn't their probation close on them? Again, most times when we think of the judgment, we think of the whole idea of finality. And so we don't see always the process, but we think in terms of the final resolution. And so what I would say to to our questioner is that hey listen the whole question of the sin against the holy spirit is a process in a person's life it is not that today you get up and you what is the sin of the well let me just pedal back a little what is the sin against the holy spirit the sin against the holy spirit is to deny the power of the holy spirit to transform your life to turn you around to bring you into the presence of god and to make you acceptable in the presence of God in accepting the sacrifice that Jesus made. If you continue to deny that, then the Spirit no longer has its full control and power over your life. So you find yourself at a place where you're unable to respond to Him because you no longer hear His voice. And so that is the sin against the Holy Spirit. And so if somebody does that, it becomes difficult for them again to be able to be influenced by the Holy Spirit. And we, we somehow don't describe them as having their probation closed because as long as they are alive, they are open and can be open to the pleading of the Holy Spirit. People can turn around. I believe that the voice of the Holy Spirit can become again allowed in an, a person's experience and they can turn and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I would say that, you know, yes, the sin against the Holy Spirit in terms of how Christ describes it, meaning that if a person has alienated the Spirit to the point where they no longer hear it, that's it for them to a certain extent. And that we need to bear in mind always. Well, you know, Christine Aaron, her question is similar to Trudy Hayne's question. She says, I would like to know, according to the pre-advent judgment, can someone probation close when they are alive? So the answer is yes. According to the pre-advent judgment, everybody's probation will be closed when they are alive. That's the whole nature of the pre-advent judgment. So the pre-advent judgment takes place when God is finished with his judgment. He will stand up and declare the just will be remain just and the unjust will remain unjust. At that time, Everybody still would be, those who are alive would still be alive. And probation would have been closed for everybody. Beyond that, there is no point of repentance. And so that needs to be appreciated. I think the deeper desire on the part of the questioner, though, is something that we always struggle with, which means, is it possible for somebody to currently, actively now, as judgment is going on, find themselves where God would have already decided on them and there is no longer any hope for them. And I would want to go out and say that where there is life, 
there is hope. Jesus declares, if any man will come after me, deny himself, take up his cross and follow me, him will I accept. Anyone who accepts Jesus Christ have eternal life. So that as long as you have the capacity to accept Jesus Christ, eternal life is available to you. And if we go back to the question I was asked before, because it is the Holy Spirit that brings us to Christ, that awakens our desire for Christ, that brings us, creates opportunity for us to come to Christ. It is the Holy Spirit who does that job. So if we spurn him, if we deny him, if we if we grieve him, then it becomes difficult for the Holy Spirit to do its work and thus create the process of transformation in our lives. And so as long as we are alive, the Holy Spirit is still continuing to woo us, to beseech us, to, to open our eyes to the opportunity that God has presented. And so again, my question is, I believe that as long as a person is alive and God has not made his declaration, that person has an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And God will save anyone. Anyone who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. And that's the declaration of Jesus Christ. And that's a promise you can take to the bank and cash. Anytime you come to Christ, he will not in any way cast you out. Amen. Thank you for your food for thought this morning. And so we want to jump into this week's lesson, the judging process. I don't know, Pastor Joseph, there are lots of people who are afraid of the courtroom and judgment and all of this process. And so our memory text comes from 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. And you know, we have to ask you to tell us What's your understanding of our memory text? You know, the Apostle Paul says that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. In other words, everybody, everybody has to come before the judgment. Nobody is excluded. Everybody must present themselves to the judgment. Or everybody is under the judgment of Jesus, of Christ. Uh, let me put it that way. The second point that is being made is that we will receive our due, our reward based on what is done in the body. And I really wanted to emphasize that because, you know, this quarter, we're talking about the nature of man. We're talking about the whole idea of what happens to a person when he die. And so the Apostle Paul is emphasizing that, hey, listen, it is the things that are done in the body that you are judged for. Nothing happens outside of the body. And so it's a reinforcement that our encounter with God has only to do with what transpires in the body. When we die, nothing happens. We just go back to the dust as it is. That's how it is. The other point that is being made is that even good people, as well as bad people will appear before the judgment. And, and so there is no escaping of the whole judging process. Everybody must give an account for the way they have lived their lives that God has given them or made them stewards over. And it's important for them to be able to appreciate that. And so Paul, again, is very emphatic that you have to answer to the things that you do. I can't just live anyhow, live callously, do anything, say anything, um, treat people any way you like, and not know that you have to give an answer for your behavior. You know, and uh, for those of us who love to say, I am my own man, or I make my own choices, um, or nobody tells me what to do, or nobody forces me to do what I don't want to do. For whatever you do, you have to answer for it. You know, Pastor Joseph, I just want to go back to... The last question we look at that talks about can anybody you know, in the pre-advent judgment, could they still be alive and their probation close? And what about the situation with Saul when he appeared before the witch of Endor, calling upon her to bring up the prophet Samuel? 
And soon after the proclamation, the prophecy, where he, he died and all of that. Could it be? Is it possible? So just share with us a little bit. Just clear that up because, you know, that came to my mind. So let's talk about it. <laughs> I, I, again, I, I made the point that as long as a person is alive, they have the opportunity to choose God every time. Now, Saul is an interesting case, and it's something that we need to bear in mind. Saul had lived his life, he had alienated God, he had stopped listening to God completely. And that is consistent with what we said about listening to the Holy Spirit in terms of his being able to provide guidance. Saul found himself at a place where he could no longer hear the voice of God. But the Bible is very interesting. The Bible never, never said that he had been sealed up. God no longer listened to him as king. God no longer had chosen him as king. But God, God had rejected him as king. But God had not rejected him. There's no evidence that God had rejected him as an individual. And so it is. it was Saul's choice to go to the witch of Endor because he wanted answers that only God could provide. And if God wasn't provided for him, he would try to get it somewhere else. That does not necessarily seem indicate that your probation is closed. What it indicates is that your heart is growing darker and darker and darker. And it is a place where God would want to pull you back from. And so that is important. And I believe that even even in that point that God was seeking to draw Saul back to him. i give you another case. You haven't mentioned it. But when we come to the Old Testament, Samson had put, pushed God to the point where the, the Bible emphatically declared that the Spirit of God left him. Okay. So in the Old Testament, we have, we have a, a declaration that the Spirit of God had left Samson. And yet still, when Samson cried out to God, God heard him, remembered him, and answered his prayer. And the Apostle Paul lists him as amongst the faithful. And so it tells us that, hey, listen, God is no respect to a person. As long as a person is able to reach out to him, God is willing and ready to save. All right. Thank you so very much. Just think I had to clear it up for somebody who may not quite have gotten it. So thank you, Pastor Joe. You know, in the day of final judgment, every lost soul will understand the nature of his own rejection of truth. Question for you, Pastor, the theologian in the house. How will they understand this? Because one, those who are saved, who have accepted Jesus Christ, will know that they, their acceptance of truth brings the reward that Jesus promises and that is a new heaven, new earth, mansions in heaven, eternal life. They would know that. Um, those who have chosen not to serve Jesus will know the truth about, about this because they would know that they are condemned. They would know that they, they are not part of the first resurrection. They would see the city of God coming down and they would know that they would have missed out on the opportunity. So, so that would be clear evidence to them about the choice that they would have made. If you cling to self, refusing to yield your will to God, you are choosing death. To sin, wherever found, God is a consuming fire. If you choose sin and refuse to separate from it, the presence of God, which consumes sin, must consume you. Ellen G. White from The Thought from the Mount of Blessings, page 62. How does this quote help us understand the nature of the executive judgment? The nature of the judgment is, of the executive judgment, is to ensure that sin is destroyed in its entirety. And if sin is found in the individual, then that individual, wherever sin is found, it has to be destroyed. And so you, you need to be able to understand that the executive judgment is designed to get rid of sin in its totality. No matter where it is found, it has to be not rooted out, but destroyed. And so that final executive judgment, before 
you had a time to root it out and get rid of it. Now, it, there is no time to root it out. It will be destroyed with whatever it has contaminated. And that is the, the case. You know, a long time ago, when folks were diagnosed with TB or tuberculosis, they would burn all the things that they touched on, the clothes that they wear, the bed that they slept on, and so on, just to be able to obliterate the virus from the environment. And even recent times when we had the whole matter of AIDS and, and even with, with COVID, you find that in the earlier stage, people were so scared that they would destroy anything that they came in contact with. So those are things we recognize that as long as there's an opportunity for a germ, a pathogen, a virus to resume or to come back to life or to be active again, that we have to find some way of controlling it or destroying it. And it's the same with sin. It is the same with sin. And sin will not rise up a second time. Never. Therefore, it has to be obliterated. I like the way Peter, in Second Peter 2 and verses 6, 4 to 6, that you need to recognize that God didn't give the angels a chance. God didn't give those who rejected the message in the antediluvian world a chance. God didn't give those who rejected the message again in Sodom and Gomorrah a chance. But he obliterated them so that they no longer can have the impact on the world as they did. And those are something that we need to bear in mind. You know, the day of the Lord is coming as a thief in the night, and the heavens, the earth, the, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and everything that's in it shall be burnt up. And that, that's the nature of what's going to happen in the executive judgment. And we need to be able to pay attention to that and know that there is absolutely no chance if we harbor or hold on to one iota of sin that it is enough to destroy us. Amen. We move on to our second question. It says, dwell on the idea presented at the end of Tuesday's lesson that not one of the lost will face final judgment until after the redeemed have been part of the judging process. Again, what does this teach us about the openness and transparency of God? It is amazing. I was reflecting on the fact, even with what's happening in America now, you know, th these documents that they received from, from the former president. And there was a call because some of them are of such a secretive nature that not any and everybody can see them. There was a call for a special master to be appointed to review the document to, to someone who has the, as they say, the, the clearance um, to see those kind of documents. But here in the whole millennial judgment, the Bible declares that God will open up the books, <laughs> that he will open up all the books, uh, that the saints would be able to look in the books and see everything. There is nothing that is top secret anymore. They, they, everything has been declared what they would say, can't follow the, the sequence in terms of America, but they, they have been relegated from top secret to just ordinary document that every saint can see. And that is, and again, we go back to, the, to government. There are some documents that, that, that only certain levels of government can see. You have to have certain clearance. And that, to some extent, in our society is regarded to a certain degree as being transparent. But in God's judgment, transparency means that those who have been judged will be able to see all the evidence that were presented on their behalf. And those who were condemned, the saints will be able to look at all the evidence. And that's the degree of the transparency of an almighty God who is omniscient. What a mighty God we serve. And so that's awesome. That's awesome. And especially coming out of our experience to know that the one high and exalted is able to say to us, listen, see why I made this decision. There's nothing top secret here. You can see everything. Daniel says and Revelation says that when judgment was called, that the books were brought. Even the book of life was brought. And so it is amazing. That for me is transparency at its best. And the follow-up question, for a universe in which love reigns, 
Why is this transparency so important? It's like our relationship. We, we see the, the marriage relationship as a paramount of all relationship. And there is nothing like being open and transparent in it. You know, letting people know where you stand and what where you are, where you have been, what you have done, how you have done it. There's nothing like being transparent. I mean, as human beings, we can't handle the transparency at times. But here, you know, God is saying, listen, I don't have anything to hide. Or what I have done is not something that I would want to hide from you. So I want you to see it for yourself. I want you to see the evidence. I would want to think that, thank God we're going to be transformed. Thank God we, this mortal is going to put on immortality and this. Even in our state, we can't handle transparency. When people show us who they are, we tremble. And, and when people reveal to us what they have done, it gets us scared. And we, we want to throw in the towel. We want to walk away from it. We can't handle it. But God says, hey, listen, no, I'm not afraid of that. And I believe that you're mature. All of the saints of the angels, God believe that they are mature. He can trust them with the truth about their loved one. He can trust them with the truth about church leaders. He can trust them with the truth about why some were saved and some were lost. It is amazing. And that, for me, is love at its best. Amen. And our final question. How will the participation of the saints in the millennial judgment comfort them in regard to the loved ones who will be lost? Clearly, they will discover in the millennial judgment that God acted out of love and concern and caring for all mankind. And so they will no longer feel bitter you know uh sometimes you go to the court and your, your loved one is on the judgment and you might think that they might be guilty but you might think that the, the judging process wasn't fair and, and so you, you come up with some anger yes my cousin or whatever it is might have been guilty but they should not have treated him or treated her that way but when you would have looked at the way god would have done the process you would say wow 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 just and true are thy ways. And so that would confirm for them the impartiality, the ability of God not to favor one over the other. It, you know, it, it's something that would speak in a very profound way and help us to be able to accept and appreciate what has happened to our loved ones. The fact that we're not going to be with them forever and ever. You know, the other thing is to demonstrate that God's justice means that the wicked has to be punished. The, the fact that, listen, if God is going to be just, people have to get the reward that they have worked for. And that is important. In uh, as much as you might think you will be sorrowful over your loved one, you will be able to see why, why they ended up being condemned. And so it is, it's important for, for that to happen. To, you know, just to be able to go through the records. I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing the God we serve. You know, to be able to know and feel, come. I, I mean, I listen sometimes, watch where, when some people are crying out for their loved one. Their loved one might have been lost for years. Might have been lost for years. But there is no settlement in the, in their mind because one, they don't know what would have happened, whether they died in a horrible death or whether they had lived on somewhere else. And so they just need that comfort in their mind to know exactly what happened to their loved one. And so I think, you know, it is that part of our humanness that God will answer that, hey, listen, you can settle in your mind what has happened and why it has happened, and you can go on living for eternity, not worried, on knowing that this person would have made their choice after God would have entreated them so long, so long, so hard. And Pastor Joseph, I agree with you, you know, we expect the people around us to be saved with us. And especially people we would have gone to church with all our lives. And the shock of them not being there may raise some questions in our head. But the just God that we serve will lay the records bare so you can see with your own eyes how many times the Holy Spirit tried to woo this person on the right path. And transparency and accountability, they go hand in hand. Now you chose to live a certain way. God is not going to force any one of us to accept him as Lord of our lives. 
the choice we make today determine our future tomorrow. And I think this is what this whole week we've been looking at the judgment process, the life that you live determines what happens in the end. Now, we just want to thank everybody for joining us here today. You have nothing to fear when you hear the word judgment. Why? Yes, we stand accused, as the song says. And the song says there's a list a mile long. Maybe mile longer for some, mile shorter for others. Of all my sins, of everything I've done wrong. The thing is, we don't have to die for our sins. Jesus paid the price already on Calvary's cross. He says, if you confess your sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so this morning, I just want to invite you to turn your life to God. I know we're on the end of a old year. We're just about to enter a new one. I'm asking you to reconsider just where you stand with God, not only today, but always. The judgment is nothing to be fearful of once you have a relationship with the judge. Have a wonderful morning, everybody, and whispering hope. And see you tomorrow. And God bless. And happy Sabbath when he comes around.